All right, everyone. My name is Lina An. I'm coming from the University of Washington Baker Lab, and uh, um, it's going to be changing gear again. Everything I show here is protein, also molecule, not a DNA. <laughs> So anyway, uh, by the way, just just a little bit disclaimer because we are also se seeking for pat patent for um, of the study. So I have to just use uh, whatever published in Baker Lab before to basically talk about the problem, what's the challenges, and then. But anyway, like it's going to be really exciting. And then let me know if you have any ideas. Especially, I'm really really excited about like any collaborations possible happening. So first of all, why we are doing small molecule binding? Apparently, this is not really something we talk about over the past day because everyone is doing DNA and, uh, and small machines. So first of all, if you already have the interaction there and then which is already validated, you can change the, uh, change the uh, affinity, change the kinetics, and then the application would be pretty obvious. First of all, if you're binding, um, I mean, I say pipette, I remember one person talk about nanopore, you can literally just using the nanopore structure to do the peptide sequencing, et cetera. And then of course, if you're binding, oh my god. Yeah, I think I probably touched the computer. I should stop doing that. <laughs> All right. So if you if you if you are like, let's say like binding to a metabolus, and then you can literally just create probes on that, and then of course, and then if you uh, oh, another thing which are actually we are also doing as well, uh, just binding to the, some ther uh, therapeutically valuable compounds, and then this here is an already published. Uh, result from another group, they repurposed a GPCR binding protein, which is uh, GPCR protein binding to small molecule ligands, and then you can trace the small molecule synthesis uh, in the <laughs> in cells pretty nicely um, using a coupled uh, DNA circuits. And then another thing, binding to cofactor, of course, you use it to design enzyme, and binding drug or toxin, you use it to do drug release and also like toxic, uh, detox using like uh, molecule sponges. And lastly, I have to add this sentence because everyone here is doing machines. If I, uh, when I validate um, small molecule glue, and then you guys can just repurpose it and using it to build a nano machine. So all right, so how do we design small molecule binders? Usually for, uh, for uh, in, since in the Baker lab, we first of all generate really, really high quality scaffolds. Uh, for small molecule binding, we usually generate scaffolds having have pockets inside. These are two types of scaffolds uh, published before. Previously, before the DR method age, we use the blueprinting method, Rosetta, to actually build it, which is slow, um, and also the quality is, uh, quality is difficult to characterize. And then afterwards, when we already have the, these scaffolds, we dock the ligands using a greedy way into the scaffold so that we have lots of starting point to actually design and look at. And then afterwards, we will, uh, we, we will do the design using Rosetta uh, you, onto the docks and then um, um, filter the designs based on the Rosetta, uh, Rosetta matrix, and then currently, of course, we uh, and then even before the DR measure design state, uh, time, we already figure out many matrix which are really, really highly correlated with uh, experimental data, which are pretty good indicators to look at. And then lastly, as you have already talked talk about, we use the uh, display measure to um, check the design quality uh, in a high throughput manner. And then, of course, why small molecule binding problem is so difficult, and then how DR method is going to help us to solve these problems. I am actually using a pre previously published example to actually show you uh, what type of stuff we are trying to uh, solving. 
let's say this is a small molecule binding to a scaffold we designed before this, this structure we already published. And then you can see there are three key interactions I point out. And then those we call as short range interaction uh, when we do the monitoring. And then as you can see, they're really sh they're, their distance is really short, like three astromes, something like that. And then also they're really, really uh, limited. Uh, they are really sensitive to the angle and direction how the interaction are formed. So if you're actually looking at a protein-protein interactions, uh, I cannot recommend on DNA because I don't work on that, but for protein-protein, you can imagine it's going to be an interface working with the interface, and then the directionality of that interface is probably going to be more, be more tolerant. So your energy well is going to be uh, going to be more shallow. And then, of course, this is, I'm not really saying protein-protein interaction is easier. I'm just saying like protein-protein interaction we are designed. The starting point is slightly easier for you to sample because you can start find the shallow lower point and then slowly sample and then go into the well. However, if you look at a small molecule, because I mentioned there, we are really we really need the small short range interaction to happen. That means the well energy well is going to be pretty sharp. And then during the sampling, if your rotomer is going to have a little bit in a, a little bit wrong, then that means you're you're just going to jump around and never fall into that well. Uh, of course, this is again a pretty simplified like um, like picture. Now I'm going to like use some ad experimental data to tell, uh, to um, to show you what I'm saying is actually what happened when when we were trying to design. And then this is uh, also another published example. So first of all, these are actually crystal data I'm showing you, and then this is a wrong design. You can say first of all in one, in chain A and chain B, the key rotomers they are actually really really close. The the ligand itself is also really close, but one of the rotomers is actually flipping downwards. That's actually one, uh, one example of how sensitive this rotomer, um, rotomer interaction can be, because then you, once the K-rotomer is wrong, then your ligand is going to be, to be moving around. And then another interesting thing about, uh, about another chain, which is chain C of this, uh, this design. As you can see, actually all the K-rotomers are extremely, uh, are, uh, are basically at the same place, but the ligand itself actually flip, like uh, for, 180 degree. So the ligand binding pose is actually different in different chains. So this is basically telling us, first of all, of course, you, once you get bind, binder, that's always a good thing. Um, but the case is you have to be super accurate about your rotomer. Then starting at a high accurate scaffold is more imp uh, is an important thing. But unfortunately, of course, these binders are not really as uh, as what we designed. The major thing is first of all for the ligand flipping is because the interface packing can be further improved because if you look at the native binders, they are extremely well packed and well uh, well uh, well organized between the interaction uh, and the ligand. And lastly, uh, for the wrong rotomer, this is majorly the reason is because for the sampling, we cannot really just sample everything, right? And then for, especially for this wrong rotomer, we actually never sampled in Rosetta. So, okay. So the way to change, uh, so we worked on how to, uh, to uh, on solving these three problems, and then we already submitted half of the um, part of the res uh, research result, and then hopefully you guys can see that result on paper uh, quickly. And then first of all, to address the scaffold issue, because previously we only have really limited fold type to uh, use, so that it doesn't really handle lots of the different shape and different size of the ligands. So we actually use DR Mazer to design a big range of different scaffolds which current hip can basically handle any type of small mo uh, molecule and pack it really well. And then also we can use DR Mazer to make sure this scaffold are really accurate. And then that's the that's good uh, start, starting point. And nextly, because uh, for example, for the uh, for the for the ligand, we are we want to drag it into the uh, into the like energy well quickly. So we the strategy we use is to pre-organize these ligands using key interactions. And then nextly, of course, the most important part, which is the DR-based ligand sequence design method. So again, this problem is basically the uh, ligand itself is um, pre-positioned pre into the scaffold. The scaffold backbone is not moved, so it's a fixed backbone sequence design problem with the understanding of ligand. 
So again, uh, the design, the major design pipeline of the scaffold itself is we generate the sequence, we use alpha fold and not Rosetta fold, and also the new DR measure we developed, including the protein MPN. I didn't really read that, probably should. And then we generated more than 10,000 diverse protein scaffold. Each of them are different and then holds different, uh, different ligand nicely. And then all of their quality, uh, uh, their, their quality is pretty high. And just quickly show you uh, for the sizes, we have different, uh, if we measure the pocket, we have different volume and also different, uh, different ratio of different metric of pocket, which can just basically hold any type of ligands. And for the de sequence design part, um, okay, I will just flash. Um, so basically, uses, uh, you, again, using the new DR measure, design measure, currently we already uh, figure out that um, if we use our own type of uh, protein, it's basically can always find the good interaction with extremely different type of ligand. And then currently we're just like working on just using, uh, working on verify all, uh, all of them in the wet lab. Um, so future stuff, so basically we should do the full atom DR measured, which can understand the rotomers, so we can do more accurate rotomers. And then uh, also ligand aware uh, DR measured. And that's, that's that and more challenging because we have limited amount of data, don't have co-evolution data. And then also we're currently also working on, of course before it's always you first start with the scaffold and then uh, design the scaffold to your ligand, but currently actually a more better and interesting method would be you start with the interaction which we, to, the scaff, to the ligand and then build a scaffold around it, which technically should actually feel better. And then acknowledgement, uh, let me know if there are any questions. Thank you. Very nice work. Um, I, I was curious how you deal with situations that are sort of induced fit, uh, right? So, so you, you have a ligand, uh, the scaffold then changes its conformation based upon the, the ligand, or you, you just assume that you have a potential and that's it. Uh, so the idea is currently we're just, uh, first of all, for the scaffold side, we're just making the scaffold really st stiff and rigid and then make sure the scaffold for don't move, move, move too much. And then for the ligand side, actually we found if we, if the interaction is really interlocked and the packing is really good, we can actually just bind to the, uh, the defined rotomer because we actually start from really, really no high number of rotomer, like as, as, as many of like a few hundred rotomers and then you fit into the scaffold and to figure out which, which type of interaction can actually hold in the end. But, but is the assumption that it just doesn't matter? Uh, I think we're not really there yet. It's because, like, you know, dynamic designing, it's, it's currently slightly still difficult side to simulate anyway, yeah. Okay. <laughs>